You got talking points and everything? <laughs> Something like that. Something like that. Whose idea was it to get the ones who are always late to the party <laughs> into one room? Am I always late? <laughs> Actually, you're pretty good. You're pretty good on time. But we are rolling. Thanks for coming on board, guys. Glad to be here again. Thank you for having us. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to keep this on here because I want to get sponsored by Bang Energy. <laughs> Bang Energy. Because last time I had rain, but they didn't want to sponsor us. So it's it's an I'm going off for Bang now. But you got to like... Is it Position it proper, it bro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you gotta get the best bang for your buck. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. All right, our guests today, we got Gurjot and Jason returning. And we got one of our newer agents on board, Tracy. Tracy, Hi. how you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Good, good. Good, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So I guess we might as well just ask you. Well, welcome to Oracle. Um, how are you finding everything so far? Really good. Yeah. Team's great. Everyone's amazing. Um, everyone's like family people. So it really translates into the team. So it's really feels like I've joined like a massive family. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been doing it for? With real estate real or estate. the team? Oh, real estate now for like just over three years. Three years. Love it. It's and, great. Um, what, what a lot of people don't know, or maybe they do know, is that both of you guys um, knew each other before Oracle. Um, was that through work or? Yeah, we actually used to be at the same office previously together. Yeah. And we worked on a team previously as well, right? So yeah. when I came over, I had told her how fantastic Oracle was. Yeah. And then she was actually helping us out with a couple of things uh, with actually a Vietnamese client. And then things just kind of clicked with everyone. And yeah, one thing led to another. And then here we are now. Mm -hmm. That's I think that's uh, the best part. Like most of our team members, they've all came in like organically. Where it's like, you yeah. know, relationship building. No one's like, you know, been like full and like recruited or like they came in like, hey, I really want it's all like relationship first and then <laughs> it just organically came together. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the like with Gerjot over here, Big G, he's one of the OGs <laughs> of the team. Um, you you kind of saw it from the start to where we are today. So yeah. Kind of like tell us like how's how's it been looking for you? On your end? Uh, no, it was great. So uh, originally, so Sonny uh, is my brother-in-law. He's married to my cousin. So um, I think he's messaging me. And uh, he's just like, hey, I'm putting the Avengers together. Putting together the a real estate team. I was like, all right, let's so do this. So we got the Hulk over here. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, we got in. Uh, Jim, me, uh, David, Sonny. And then, you know, slowly team kept growing. Um, and, you know, kind of uh, moved to a brokerage as well. Grew a little bit more. And, you know, it is where we are today. All right, but... 12 agents now? 13? Mm -hmm. 12, 13? 12 now. 12. Yeah. yeah. And then three, is three staff. Is, yeah. Yeah, yeah three, three staff. So honestly, it's great. Like, we're growing. Uh, I know, like, you know, on the back end, like, Sonny and David, they have, like, big, big goals for the team and how we're, you know, we're trying to take over Abbotsford, Fraser Valley, you know, bigger and bigger, moving to other provinces and stuff like that. So, you know, uh, I think uh, we're on a great uh, trajectory and uh, we're all going to get there together. No, it's, it's, it's super cool how everything has been progressing so far. I'm, I'm very excited for what's happening. Obviously, like you just mentioned, you're coming from the start, then kind of like I'm here, and then you came, and now you're here. It's just best is yet to come, honestly. There's yep. a lot of things happening. So um, with you guys knowing each other, being on a team, and then you guys went solo for a bit, right? Mm -hmm. And then you guys are back on the team, like... Can you guys tell me, like, what is the difference between, what are you guys finding the bigger differences being on a team as opposed to working on your own? I'll let you answer that first. I found that when you're working on your own, it's easy to get over the hard times. Not necessarily easy, but when your back's kind of against the wall, you're going to figure things out. But when it comes to your successes, that's where things get a little bit dull. So when I joined the team, I told David and Sonny, like, there's more value that you guys are providing me aside from leads, money, and growing my business, right? Yeah. So uh, it's been very great for me, just the fact that I have people that keep me accountable because I'm a firm believer that accountability is like one of the strongest forms of love, right? So um, it's nice that I have people around me that are going to pull things out that might not be performing to their best. And they're actually going to hold me accountable and actually help to fix those things or kind of rectify them and make me better in that way. So I think that's been a huge boost for myself. And that's definitely something I miss being on a team as well, right? And especially now, uh, like you said, we have 12 agents and the turnover rate's been extremely low. I don't think we've had anyone that actually joined and left, right? So um, it's just been a really good trajectory moving forward. And I hope that's never the case. Like it's it's one big happy, one big happy family, right? Yeah. So, Hopefully uh, getting bigger and bigger, right? <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Now you Tracy, what do you think? 
Yeah, oh, <laughs> both of you. yeah. So, um, just in regards to, for me, it's more so like I've never really started real estate for the money. Mm -hmm. Um, and then just working from a team and then being solo, you kind of know the difference between celebrating your wins with other people. And then also just feeling like we're going somewhere together. So to me, that's really important. And I think that's a lot, you know, more valuable than kind of doing it by yourself and figuring it out and all of that. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. I actually had a question. So just from what you guys both kind of said, so you know, newer agents, some of them, like, what do you think would be better to start off as, as an agent on your own or joining a team and starting off that way? I would definitely say team. Cause at the end of the day, uh, you have some sort of guidance and especially if you're working with a successful team that is doing high volume and you have leaders that have been in the business for a while, they're able to kind of put you on your way and you can do these things. So these tasks don't seem so daunting, whether you're looking at, for example, door knocking, right? It's such an invasive thing. And a lot of people are scared to actually go approach random people, especially at their doorstep. Just having a mentor with you that's actually willing to go out there and do these things, it kind of puts you in that mindset that, hey, this person doesn't need to be doing it and they're willing to do it. So what excuse do I have not to, right? And that can be with anything, just all forms of prospecting. Yeah. I think for me, it's it was really valuable to start out real estate as a solo agent to really see what the struggle is and mm -hmm. knowing how like every deal is really different from the last deal, even now being in the industry for like a few years is still that way. Um, I think focus is trying to find mentors first. And then if you have a really solid mentor, you're going to be okay. But you don't really know the value of being on a team until you actually do it on your own first to see what it's like out there. Yeah. And yeah. just to kind of dovetail on that, um, you got to be really picky and choosy about which team that you're joining. Yeah. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not becoming just a puzzle piece and the growth kind of stops there for somebody else's team or their business. You want to make sure there's actual growth for you to actually move forward and kind of look past, maybe say, Hey, you know what? Uh, am I happy being here for a year? Am I happy being here for five years? Am I happy continuing my career with this and possibly even retiring with the team? Right. So, yeah. yeah. And you guys bring up a great point. Whereas, um, <clears throat> There is something about getting thrown into the fire, or getting thrown in the ocean and learning how to swim, should I say, right? For mm -hmm. you guys being a solo agent, like the um, w going through a lot of those struggles and really trying to figure out how are you going to be able to overcome that on your own when your back's against the wall. So I really like the idea that you guys put there for that. And even with the team side of things, it's another benefit that a lot of people don't talk about is like how accessible, like if you, there's so many things that you don't know in this industry. Um, like for example, like for me to not know something and then I'm calling David or Sonny at like 11 PM, which just happened last week. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you're kind of just walking through it together. There's so many things you don't know. So to have that guidance and it's really one of those things where making sure that you're finding not just a random team, but you really have to see it as that team lead as a mentor of yours, right? What are some of those valuable things that um, that mentor brings that you want to kind of have that impartation amongst yourself to really be the best agent that you can be? So really be thinking about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. and the amount of experience they have, like mm -hmm. that's one thing like uh, David has experience in almost like any, any like sort of uh, situation in any transaction. So even like small questions regarding like lawyers, notaries, all that stuff, like he's most likely been there. So it's a great person. Yeah, same thing. I talk, mm -hmm. Call him in the morning, call him in the evening. He's got his phone on him. He's on a trip. Call him like, hey, what do we do here? And he's like, all right, this is this. And yeah. so he's always got the answers usually. Yeah. But he, just as a new, bro a new agent, uh, as you would be kind of interviewing brokerages, uh, you want to make sure that you're kind of making sure that the team that you're aligning yourself with actually aligns their values with you as well, right? So yeah. if your team leader doesn't share similar goals and aspirations as yourself, then maybe that not, might not be the right team for you to join. Fair I enough. think that's why I mentioned like when you first start on real estate, focus on finding mentors because that's kind of the people that you learn to respect and then also see how they do their business. And eventually you'll transition into, you know, who are they're working with, who, who do they trust and all of those things. Cause if you're kind of just going in blind and you're just looking for, you know, anywhere or anyone to learn from, you're kind of going to get yourself stuck in a situation. There's a lot of new agents out there that's like joining teams and they get disappointed because they have these expectations and they just don't know. And they're not talking to any other seasoned agents. So they, really don't know, right? Mm -hmm. They just get themselves kind of um, 
lost in the sauce a little bit. Lost yeah. in the sauce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just learning from like other agents, like I went on with Jason, just uh, door knocking and open houses. And he has, because uh, he's, you know, focused on that a lot early in his career. So he has a lot of like good, like just small little things, small little tips and tricks that will just help you just with your attentiveness, uh, dealing with uh, somebody, you know, interacting and all that stuff. So it's actually like great little points that can just, you know, add value to your own uh, repertoire. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we pick up so much of all, off of each other, right? Yeah. And it's not necessarily always David and Sunny that's going to be teaching us yeah, something. Yeah. There's agents on the team that have less experience than myself, and I've learned so much from, right? So uh, there's value all around. Yeah. yeah. Name an example. I'll give you an example. Uh, well, Gurjot mentioned me, right? So I can mention Gurjot <laughs> on the ar our agricultural side of things, right? I know little to nothing about farms. Uh, you know, I have done farming for a bit. My family did lease a farm for a while, but he's bred and born into it, right? So uh, at the end of the day, when anything happens, as far as any farm deals, um, I'm always going to be going to Gurjo. And just like ourselves, we were working on a commercial deal last week. Uh, same thing for that. Um, that's your like scope of um, expertise, you could say. And at the end of the day, I'm always going to come to you because uh I want to provide the best service possible for my clients and I'm not going to be doing any guesswork whatsoever. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm coming to the source for the information. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. And even like we, we spoke about this on the last time you were here about you being the agriculture specialist. Like right now is like farm season. Hey, yeah, I'm busy. Uh, it's uh, winding down right now. Like the hardy part of it was like in uh, late July, early August. Yeah. And now we've got a couple of varieties of blueberries still left and it's kind of a uh, coming to end in a couple of weeks and uh, all the farmers are, Probably looking forward to that. Just all their hard work, which is like 12, at least minimum 12 hours every single day wow. for a full, like the full summer. Yeah. And yeah. talk us through that because like there, there's two sides of this is with you being an agriculture specialist, it's not just because you've done a lot of agriculture deals, which that is the case, but it's because you're living this day in and day out. So you know it. Like how is, how has this farm season been? Like what's like a typical season, like, like a day, like, cause Obviously, I don't know as much as you. Yeah. So a uh, season, like, uh, as an outlook, you know, you look at a season starting from around, like, March, April. That's when you got to get the whole field ready in the spring where, you know, uh, flowers start blooming. You got to get everything ready for fertilizing, all that stuff. That's usually early. Uh, in May, you prep the fields, get them all ready. Uh, berries are starting to show. Uh, and then the harvesting, that's probably the most uh, labor intensive. And that's going to be your full, like, depending on what varieties you have, there's, that's one thing people don't know. There's a lot of different varieties. Uh, there's early varieties, like Duke is one of the early ones. Middle is kind of a blue crop and uh, Draper, a couple other ones. The then blueberries? These are all blueberry varieties. Wow. And then later on, there's uh, Elliot and Calypso. So that's kind of what we're on right now. And uh, most of them are like two and a half weeks. So usual blueberry uh, plants or fields, you're going to pick them like two or three times and machine pick or a hand pick, either or. And they're different prices. So if you have hand pick, that's a, you can sell it for more and a machine pick a little bit less. Can you tell the difference? Like one. Uh, Once they're like off of not the Not uh, like too much, like uh, the machine pick gets a little, it's more, uh, it's been handled more. That's like it's dropping from the bushes down to a machine and then it goes on to different conveyor belts and all that. Mm -hmm. But the machine pick, they at the processing plant, they have to go through more of a process. It has to be clean more, there's more green berries there, so it has to be filtered out more and more. Um, and the words hand pick, like people are picking just the blue blueberries that are full on ripe, so they're coming off the bushes. And but... Uh, yeah, and during the harvest times, it's literally you start in the morning, like 6, 7 a.m., and mm -hmm. your last load is going out at like 8, 9 p.m., wow. so they're full days. <laughs> yeah. Wow. It's just, like, I remember this one time we were all in the office, and because, like, we know it's 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 blueberry season. You're you're busy. <laughs> and then you showed up in the office, and all of us are, like, cheering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's here. <laughs> hey, guys. Welcoming myself yeah. to the team again. <laughs> <laughs> introducing myself. Yeah, awesome. I think uh, that's where you've been. <laughs> I think a lot of people like they think that farming, like the hard work, is in the harvest and stuff, and they kind of forget about the prep work too, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't understand that you're going to be waking up with the sun, and you're going to be out there on a tractor before it gets hot, doing all your sprays and everything, yeah, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background. Yeah. Even planting like new berries. So one thing people don't know is like, oh, they're going to get like a 
you know, like uh, either unproductive berries or like just a blank slate and they're like oh we're gonna start planting and picking right away and it's like no like we're about to rip out this one field and after we rip it out we're gonna replant it in you know either the fall or the spring and then those plants aren't gonna produce any berries for the first two years what we're gonna do is rip off the flowers even if they try to make berries we rip them off because we just want that plant to grow and then focus on the growth for the first two years then the third year you're gonna start getting some production then it started wow. growing a little bit more but first two years it's all costs Man, wow. we farmed about a five acre farm of Elliot. It was not easy whatsoever, <laughs> man. Those summers, uh, definitely tough on the whole family, man. Yeah. And it, it didn't really help that we didn't live on the farm, so we'd have to drive out to Chilliwack and all that. But mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what people not like, easy by any means. Yeah. People nowadays like when they're like, Hey, I wanna like get into farming and I'm gonna get like five or ten acres and it's very, very hard. Mm-hmm. Machinery is so expensive, like a uh, berry harvester over 400,000 mm-hmm. wow. and so and then so you got a rent that's going to be you know obviously costly as well yeah so getting into farming for the sole purpose of like I'm going to like turn this into a farm like you need to uh, have your production at a, a larger scale in a smaller scale like you'll still you know be making it but you're going to be doing a lot of work and it's easier when it's on a larger scale yeah and it's sad that the rates have taken out a lot of these smaller farms right yeah. because again that's just little mom and pop farms and you know the economy the rates have kind of just put them underwater yeah farmers yeah. uh they they're one of the most uh, optimistic people yeah. like uh, you always have to be like you know what next year is gonna be better next yeah. year is gonna be better. they're always optimistic and uh you know that's what you got to be and it's always been hard like price of everything is always going up berry price is still pretty much the same so oh, it's wow. very hard you know yeah uh, all your agriculture inputs your sprays your chemicals gone up fertilizer yeah. up renting machine up cost of machinery up everything's up yeah price is uh, still not up but good still here. <laughs> still here. <laughs> that's for the love of my dad, like absolutely loves it. And I can see the passion. Yeah. And so when I see that, I was like, that's what, uh, you know, I really like that. It's and, a labor of love. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, born and raised on the farm. I would always, you know, go to the back when I was young. And so I've loved like the farm life. So, you know, that's, that's awesome. Wild. That's what I wanted to ask. Cause you're going from like your sun up to sun down. And on top of that, you're a real estate agent, which yeah. is, you're be, you being here today, but on top of that, we, as we've already spoke about before, you're Team Canada and in, in wrestling. <laughs> like, how are you balancing all of this? Yeah, we're uh, a lot of different uh, hats, so to speak. Um, you know what? A lot of help. So obviously, when I'm on my real estate side, like I'll make the time out, especially during that. I'll try to not take out too many new clients and anybody who have like either I'm servicing them out or I'll get my team members to come and help me, which is that's why it's a great time to be on a team. Yeah. And then for the wrestling and the farm stuff, you know, uh, delegation is always there. My dad, uh, you know, we delegate if something needs to be done or I need to go out of country or out of town or something. Um, you know, my dad will make sure and me will make sure it's all taken care of. And then the wrestling stuff, uh, you know, me and another guy, we're, uh, uh, we co-coach like a sort of provincial team and the national team. So uh, we just make sure we can, uh, org- a lot of organization and uh, prep it takes. Cool. Don't want to get double legged by this guy. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring this back to you, Tracy. You said that you didn't get into the business because of money. So what was it? Tell us your journey. Oh, I feel like I did this in a, in a, a welcome video, but um, it was... Let pretty, everyone hear again. <laughs> pretty natural process. Um, started out in like hotel management and then did rental portfolio management. And then, yeah, it just always seemed like a natural uh, transition. So did tenant relocation and then went to school to get uh, my license. And here I am it's always been something that I love to do I love people facing jobs that's kind of something that I've thrived in um so just feels like I'm at the right place at the right time yeah do you still do any sort of uh rental management I'm I'm doing tenant relocation right now uh for a developer so in rental buildings that they acquire um that you know are going to be torn down and then have new rental uh put you know built back up so um, they need people like me to help relocate the tenants and then help transition them into new homes so that's what I'm doing how's that process it's good yeah Yeah. it's really great Um, I mean there's a lot of amazing rules in place that help protect the tenants and then um, you know it depends who you're working with too I'm working with really amazing developers that make sure that all of the tenants are well taken care of um, and transitions good I mean everyone's notified uh, 
you know, well ahead of time. And then there's compensation for the tenants and then moving expenses are also uh, taken care of. And then, of course, there's means to help support them through, you know, finding a place and then also getting them uh, where they want to be. So, yeah. I know we've talked about this before, but um, with the tenant relocation, I know it's a super difficult thing. And like we've talked about how it can be emotionally draining and all that. How's that kind of carried over into your real estate career where it's helped you kind of better service your clients? Um, you know what, I think in any people facing job, especially when it's such a, like you're still moving somebody from home to home, you know, the Mm -hmm. tenants that I'm relocating, they're not necessarily buying another home, but they're all, they're still, it's still a big life transition for them. So, you know, I've taken that into real estate and that you kind of have to have a lot of compassion and empathy for people. Um, and it's it's different in that like there isn't a different energy shift when somebody is buying a home and you know you're being a new homeowner or you're moving up or downsizing um and but it's still a totally different life process so i think i don't for me it's it's always been great it's all i've always had like been able to create good personal relationships with everyone um so i I don't know if I answered that question. <laughs> I didn't even really remember the question anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Have you had times, though, when you thought, like, you know what, this is really stressful, I need to take a step back? Because I can only imagine with tenant relocation, like, you're dealing with a lot of people that don't necessarily want to move, and it's not one of those situations when they are moving, it might be a congratulations. It's kind of like yeah. more... It's more yeah. like easing them into the... Because it is a really long process, right? There's Mm -hmm. the acquiring of the building and then waiting for the permits. And then at that point, tenants know that they're going to be relocated. But it's kind of a really long time frame before they actually know when they will actually need to be out. So a lot of things are up in the air and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's really hard. Um, There's also some tenants where that require a little bit more support. So, you know, seniors that everybody's on a fixed income Tenants are usually in a building for a really long time that, um, you know, rent has been relatively cheap when they first moved in and then are is extra, extra cheap now, right? And then if they want to stay in that specific area, um, it's not the same anymore in terms of rental pricing. So it's a lot harder to find something. So there are certain tenants that you have to give extra care to to move into, say, subsidized housing or senior housing or anything like that. Um, so... Yeah, I mean, honestly, you just have to stay in touch. You just have to be extra compassionate. There's other tenants that you kind of have to give more than just being a tenant relocation coordinator to them. You kind of have to be their friend and help support them through the process. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I think that, I don't know if that answered the question. I hope that answered (laughs) your question. No, you didn't answer your question. (laughs) But I have one more question. So Mm -hmm. for any new agents, for example, that are getting into the industry, Do you have any advice on how they can handle their stress? Because we know uh, when you are selling a home, it's not always going to be a happy uh, process. Some people are being forced to sell their homes because of health reasons or whatever might be going on in their personal life, right? So do you have any advice for people that are in the career or just got into the career uh, for managing stress? I would say just know that you are the professional, but you kind of chose a job where it's going to get personal sometimes too and then you just kind of have to know um when you kind of have to take the extra step to like support your clients or your buyers or sellers or anyone um it's a really emotional process for everyone so sometimes you kind of have to also be well aware of that right not every client is going to be easy to deal with but everyone's kind of going through stuff and a lot of that will translate into the transaction or the you know this stage of their life Mm -hmm. and you know, you kind of have to just learn how to separate the two and um, keep yourself level-headed and stay professional, but then also just be ready for the personal stuff that's going to come your way. Is there a time that you could think of that stands out? Um, like in regards to... <laughs> yes, yeah, so give me a moment to think about this one. <laughs> She's like, can I can I say this on camera? <laughs> I was um, gonna ask a similar question. Where I was like, it was the most like hostile like, situation in like a tenant uh, relocation. Uh, hostile? Yeah, like something that. So think about my question and think about his question yeah. <laughs> and see what what you're. What, you know, what you're um, to elaborate here. I think 
I will have to put my professional foot down on this mm-hmm. and not speak to those types of situations. Mm. <laughs> good. Because, yeah. you know, I do respect the people that I work with a lot. Um, and again, like I say, everybody's going through like a tough time. So, you know, you kind of have to be professional, but then also when you have to be there for them, that's kind of when you also, you know, just move forward from it and not have to really, it's not really a problem that yeah. that you're dealing with with a client. It's just a part of the process. Mm-hmm. So I think yeah. one thing that's super difficult is not letting this kind of trickle into other aspects of your life. Exactly. So just being kind of strong enough to draw that line and have your professional life and your personal life be a bit separate, right? Because yeah. you don't want to take other people's stress, which is definitely valid stress that they're having Very valid. and kind of carry that into other aspects of your life, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if, if like, if I, if a, mo- if a moment with a client or a tenant does feel hostile, generally you'll, if you're fit for the job, you'll know how to handle it in the, mm-hmm in that moment. And then once that time passes, generally, if you have a good relationship with them, which I hope at that point you do, um, you know, it'll, it'll be okay. And it's not really something that, um, you know, I like to speak to after it's more so just a lesson learned. And if I didn't handle it, or if they didn't handle it in that very moment very well, and we still have to continue a working relationship afterwards. Um, yeah, sometimes a conversation you kind of have to have with them, but yeah. not a conversation. <laughs> with others for those people <laughs> for you guys i'm sorry that's a great answer yeah. we'll talk about it later <laughs> you know what like client management is huge in this business We're, we kind of already um started talking about newer agents and stuff like that bringing value to them on some of the things they could think about but client management knowing how to at the end of the day we're we're here to find a solution to the problem in hand and being able to really navigate our clients through that, not just us, but our clients through that whole situation. And it sounds like you've done a great job on that. So especially because you've in that profession alone with tenant relocation, I'm sure there was quite a bit of that. It was. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Um, Jason. <laughs> Sean. <laughs> <laughs> I want it. So one of the fun things about this whole podcast is really getting to know each and every single one of them. Um, how are they like outside of the business itself? One thing that I think, one thing that stands out about Jason and I, cause we're always in the office. We start talking about current events. <laughs> then we start getting in a rabbit hole about conspiracy <laughs> theories. Oh, <laughs> so, shit. Are they conspiracy theories? Are they? <laughs> so I just wanted to bring this up here. Jason, what's your favorite conspiracy theory? I wouldn't want to call it my favorite. Cause I think it's absolutely horrible. The one that you look into the most. I would, I, again, I don't want to say I look into it, but it's definitely yeah. something I know about. And I think people openly know about as well. Uh, yeah. A lot of aspects in life are controlled by the pharmaceutical industry. It's true. Um, whether it be politics, um, a lot of it's backed by pharmaceutical companies. And then of course our food industry, right? So um, our food isn't necessarily there to keep us healthy. We eat a lot of garbage. Uh, a lot of this stuff is man-made chemicals that don't necessarily need to be there especially when we compare our foods to other countries, a lot of that stuff is not present in, let's say, a country such as like Germany or somewhere else in Europe, right? Um, It's all an industry. At the end of the day, there's no money in treating, sorry, there's no money in curing anyone. There's money in treatment. Um, If there's a pill to fix everything, I guarantee you will never get that pill. You'll get that pill that fixes you um, a certain amount, but then you're going to be back next month, right? And This is just me personally speaking, man. I've been in and out of the hospital for the last four or five years. And I've always had problems with certain levels in my blood. And with these four or five years, I don't know how many tests I've done, but I've never got a definitive answer. I've always been brought to the hospital. They'll give me a blood transfusion. They'll give me an iron transfusion. And then here I am, right? So right now I just have my blood trans, or sorry, an iron transfusion on Monday. I had a phone call with my doctor, no answers whatsoever. Let's wait. Let's do another blood test in about a week and a half, and then we'll see if you need to go back for another one. So a lot of Band-Aid fixes, right? Yeah. yeah. How are you feeling right now? I feel fantastic. Feeling good? Feeling yeah. great? Always. With your cameras in front of you. Even if I wasn't, you guys would never know. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. What's another one? Uh-huh. <laughs> I know you got to be. You're doing too much, man. You're doing too much. <laughs> fine, fine. We He's won't. got questions for Sean. <laughs> okay, go for it. Go for it. Hit me with one. 
So when somebody breaks into your house and you're jiu-jitsu, <laughs> <laughs> do you automatically just lay on but your back or do you wait for them to <laughs> kind of get down there? <laughs> we about it too. It's either you go the boxing route or the jiu-jitsu route, right? Yeah. What's another one? Go for it. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask you a real question now, okay. right? So one. you're so heavenly evolved, heavily involved in your church, right? Both yourself and Francis. Yeah. And like you guys do host a lot of programs for these kids and stuff, which I think is absolutely fantastic because a lot of these kids don't have the support and you guys are able to offer them that big brother slash like father figure role that they might not have in their own home. Right. Uh, with that, that's a lot of coaching. How's that kind of transferred into your real estate career because again we're doing a lot of coaching when we have clients in front of us that might have never sold their house they've only purchased that one whole home in their lifetime yeah that's a that's a great question and i would i would say exactly in a sense of what tracy said which is you really have to care about your client like so for example in my christian walk like we it, we're taught to love one another mm -hmm. and that's that's pretty much what i bring into my real estate um, career is like, I generally care about people when I work with them. There's, there's all sorts of reasons as to why they're selling, whether it be something happened in their family or whatever it may be, you have to care for them to make sure that you're taking them into the right place. So when I speak on like, so to further answer your question, how do I bring that coaching into it? It's like really figure out what's the best case scenario for them. Not for me, not for me as the agent, but for them. What is going to help them get into the, get into the goal that they want to achieve? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like it, it's not about me in, in this. Like if, if that means like you don't have to, you don't sell. Like if, if it makes more sense for you to keep your home, keep your home. If it makes more sense to do whatever it is. So like, even if that means giving up my commission or whatever it is, like we're going to talk about that. There's so many different ways that I could talk about this, but it's really care about your client and it's going to take not only you, a long way but them the long way and that's the most important thing so really caring for the others this is more of a comment than a question yeah but i feel that your faith in god and your trust in your church i feel like that's really pushed you in a point where it gives you this confidence in life and mm -hmm. it allows you to stay level-headed in those situations where your clients might need you to be right so you're able to guide them and lead them the correct way yeah and it, you know what it's funny that you also say that because with gurjo the, the farmer mentality it's always going to be better. It's always going to be better. That's the mentality that I have. One of the mm -hmm. things that we're taught on top of uh, loving one another is having a lot, has having faith. We need to have faith, faith that whatever is going to, whatever mountains in our way, we're going to be able to move it. And where I translate into that is just knowing that it's always going to work out in the end. I'll give you, per I'll give you an example right now. So two weeks ago, I did an offer presentation. This, we're going to use real estate as an example. And we didn't get the offer we wanted. Actually, a lot less, but we accepted it. Long story short, subjects didn't get removed. Clients were like, oh, no. Right? They were obviously upset. But I'm, o I'm always that person that's always just like, it's always going to work out at the end. We're going to find a way. Everything is going to take care of itself. Trust me. Just trust me, guys. Like, we got this. Just before this podcast, subjects were removed on a full offer, full asking price. Wow. It always works nice. out at the end. And that's what I always have to reiterate. But that's the same thing too, because at the end of the day, with you as an agent, they're looking for you for guidance. You're their leader for that amount of time that you're working, right? What are you going to be doing? Yes, there's a problem or a mountain in front of you, but you're going to have to move that. You're going to have to solve that problem. And that's kind of what we're all here for, yeah. to be able to help guide them through that whole situation. And fortunately, just like that example that I just said today, we were able to. Yeah. And that's what really, like, yeah, my Christian walk, my faith in God, like that is the biggest part of my life. And it's, oh, it translates like all glory to him. Like it's, uh, it, it takes me on to another level. Right? Yeah, so. we see it, man. And at the end of the day, like I'm not Christian, yeah. but we talk about Christianity all the time. Right. Yeah. And just because I'm not Christian doesn't mean I can't learn something from it either. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I hope, I hope those yeah. few things that I just said to you, kind of learn that oh no 100 yeah. percent. i think uh, you and tracy had like those great answers where you're like you know you have the empathy you know you're guiding them all that stuff i think that's like a big portion where you have to understand who you're working with and yeah. just guide them how and especially recognize who they are and guide them how they need to be guided some you know clients come to you and they're like very hands-on so they're kind of already informed so yeah. they're like hey just give me information that i need and that's it whereas yeah. other people need like a helping hand and like they need everything explained to them which is obviously we love to do that and but you want to be more hands-on with them and guide them how they need to be guided yeah so, 
think it's just like your job to be the, yeah. like the grounded energy. Yeah. Um, because yeah, you just can't identify a problem as a problem. A lot of times, you just have to see it as like a part of the process, and you yeah. just got to be like the leveled person to kind of get through that with them. Exactly. Totally. And yeah. I'm just gonna say this on the record: like, I hate, I hate that there is a lot of. I'm not saying all agents, but there are agents out there that just do not care about their clients. It sucks, especially because like, like. If a client will come to me like, hey, I just tried working with some with another agent and they just really didn't care, whatever it is. And it's just one of those things. It's like, guys, like this is their biggest investment of their life. Like we need to do better as an industry. There's a reason why realtors sometimes get a bad reputation. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's like talking to you guys. You guys are awesome. Like I know that you guys really care for your clients, but there's other people out there outside of the team, of course, um, that don't. And that's something that we all need to change as an industry. Yeah. Um, because like I said, biggest investment of their life. I think I had an eye-opening experience with that, yeah. like quite early into my career. And at that time, like I don't want to speak on this lady situation too much, but yeah. when I was about to host her open house, and this is something we had never previously talked about at the listing appointment or anything like that. And I kind of knew their situation, but I didn't fully know about it. Yeah. But she cried and she confessed to me exactly what was going on in her life and what the hardship she's kind of dealing with. And like, it was a huge, huge eye opener for me. And that kind of took me in a place where I thought about, Hey, this lady had the courage to share so much with me. What about the people that don't right? And those are the people that kind of get swept under the rug. And it, you might consider them just trying to move into a different house, but they have all this stuff going on in the background that you might never know about. So after that day, I kind of treated every client just like I would have treated that lady, right? So, yeah. It even goes the same way with first time home buyers, right? <clears throat> yeah, maybe it's a, it's a smaller purchase, mm -hmm. but that means a lot more, like all that capital that they're using means a lot more to them than it a big purchase potentially absolutely so it's just yeah. like sometimes like to be honest with you guys like whoever's listening out there um you may put more work into a first-time home buyer um instead of like a big time deal that's just the reality because they're gonna need you to guide <laughs> them through it they that portion means a lot more to them so making sure that you're despite whatever it is whether it be a small purchase or a big purchase treat them the same way because it's going to take you a long way. And, that's and those uh, small purchases with those first time, they're always so much more rewarding. Yeah. So At the end. Yeah. 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 Like I, I remember listening to Ryan Serhound. He said something similar to that. Like that, like he, he couldn't get any deals at the start. Ryan Serhound, um, he was pretty much like what? Arguably one of the top agents in North America. In North America. Yeah. Owns his own brokerage, even has his own Netflix special. <laughs> you guys been watching that, by the way? <laughs> um, but I remember a story where he was just nurturing this one lead that he ever got. It's just like, you know, one of those things, like when you just start, like every lead, obviously every lead means everything to you, but like he's just really dialing in on this one. And he didn't convert that lead until like year, 10 years later or something along the lines of that. But that nurturing lead, which was supposed to be like a condo or something like that, ended up like, hey, you've been following up with me for so long. I know I was looking for this, but I found some other partners. I got a better job. Next thing you know, that deal turned into his biggest deal of his life. You know wow. what I mean? Like it's the just husband like, and wife one, right? I think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. Crazy. Something similar along the lines of that. Yeah, so yeah. yeah, making sure that you're always taking care of whoever you're with. Yeah. yeah, and it just comes down like you said. Treat everyone the absolute same, right? Yeah, yeah. That excellent service goes all around. Yeah, yep. and that's like with uh, even with, even with David always preaches that too. Mm -hmm. David Center team lead, right? He always says, um, "You treat everyone the same way." Mm -hmm. uh, I think at the start he was a what did he say he was? He was a manufactured home specialist. That's right. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, and as you can see it, it, t it took him a long way to where what does that mean manufactured homes, homes? he you was know selling a lot of them <laughs> oh he was selling a lot of manufactured homes that's right Got yeah it. yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. so like that like, he was saying like that's for some reason everyone just kept going to him for that wow. so like yeah. that's all he was doing at the start and then you that's see a niche. what's yeah. that that's a massive niche yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I just sold my first mobile home like a couple of months ago here. And yeah. every question I had, he was just like, bang, bang, like answers <laughs> back and forth, right? He just knew. Yeah, he, he knew, just knew exactly everything. I've never done one of those yet. Yeah. How is that process? It sounds scarier than it is, but yeah. super easy, man. Yeah. I, I would say it's even easier than selling a condo. Is it? Yeah. Wow. 
That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wouldn't say easier. I would say less work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's, that's awesome. Um, so what, switching it up a bit <laughs> talking about niches there do you have a niche tracy what does that mean? oh do i have a niche do you have a focus um i i don't have a specific focus at this time yeah um residential would be the you know bread and butter um townhome con townhomes and condos but um i definitely want to get into commercial so yeah. that's definitely something i've been pretty vocal about on, on with the team. Yep. Um, so commercial land assemblies, um, development projects. So hopefully that will be the niche moving forward. Have you worked on land assembly yet? I have worked on a couple of land assemblies that didn't really come together, yeah. but I have worked on a few. Um, they're a very tedious process and very um, time, you know, but you require a lot of time, but you require a lot of money and there's just a lot of things up in the air, a lot of moving parts that just kind of can easily make a deal fall apart. But um, I think that's the beauty of it too. So that's yeah. why I want to get into it. I know that all too well. That was yeah. when I first started, that was one of the first things I tried putting together. Yeah. A land assembly. Oh man, there's so many things to it. Yeah. So, so many things. And it, it you, you spend a lot of time it on it. It takes years. Sure. Yeah. yeah, it takes years. And it can take like a second for it to fall yeah. apart. You can work on something for months like I've worked on, I've worked on a land assembly for months and you just think it's coming together and then it just takes really quickly for it to fall apart. But I mean, again, the beauty of it. Yeah. I guess everyone needs to be on board, right? So yeah. as soon as it's one person feels like they're not getting the best, best bang for their buck or, you know, if they feel like they might get more in the future and they want to step aside, then that whole thing falls apart. Right. Yeah. So well, it really boils yeah. down to numbers. It's not emotional at all. Um, like residential you know mm -hmm. so it's really like do the numbers work down to like the dollar so um yeah and i mean in this this you know economy here especially here sometimes it takes a lot longer to figure that out yeah and i feel like a lot of these people <coughs> that are selling their land are part of their land <coughs> assembly uh one of their main fears is where i'm gonna go and i find that a, a lot for properties like for example i door knock this one area in mission and one of the ladies that I met there, and she was an older woman, and they, I don't, I don't want to make an assumption here, but their house is probably paid off. They've probably been living there for 40, 50 years. And like the old lady and the old man, when I was talking to them, they just gave me this look and they said, where are we supposed to go? And that's something that you have to kind of coach them through as well, right? So if they feel like you're just there to get the deal done and you're working for the developer and you're not there on, be on their behalf as well, I feel like that kind of puts a sour taste in their mouth and, you know, makes it a little bit easier for things to fall apart. I found mm -hmm. a lot of that when I, when, um, when I was putting the first one together, mm -hmm. a lot of that. Yeah. So, but even, even onto that point too, it's just like everyone having different expectations. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're all agreed on one thing. Next thing you know, there's someone's like, I want five hundred thousand dollars more. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so, yeah. no, but that's awesome. Yeah. 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 So, I'm gonna get that. The niche. The niche. The niche is so hit up Tracy for all your residential needs, yeah. and then commercial. She would love to start diving into it more. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, How about you guys? What's your current niche, if you have one, and? Ideal niche. Um, I would just be agricultural farm, born and raised, so makes sense. Yeah. You, that's what you're in. That's your niche now, though, right? Yeah. 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 Well, you have a passion for it, too, right? Yeah. 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 I'd say with me is, so <laughs> I obviously started off as residential, but commercial kind of just came to me. Um, that was my first deal, funny enough, commercial. I wasn't even like looking for a commercial yeah. deal. It was like someone just calling me like, hey, um, can you help me find a lease? I'm like, okay, sure. Because <laughs> you just want to help anyone, right? So then obviously someone coming to you for the first time, you're going to be working with other people who are in the industry and in doing commercial. So you're already learning it on the go. Um, I, will never, I, I will never stop residential because one of my favorite parts about this job is possession day. Yeah. yeah. You know, when everyone's so excited, yeah. everyone's like, oh my gosh, it's my house. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's, it, it, I'm definitely always going to be passionate about that, yeah. but I'll always be doing commercial too. Yeah. It's um commercial residential. Commercial is like a bread and butter for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I feel like the, the 
part I love most about being a real estate agent is the, you know, emotional, like sales. You know, yeah, that's like the one where you you actually see their entire the process from beginning to end. You know, especially when there's family involved and stuff like that too, kids. So yeah, I, I feel you on that. No, it's super cool too. Is I don't know if I mentioned this on this podcast before, but like my first year, I did it. Like I worked on every single different niche you could think of apart from agriculture yeah. in my first year. So I did a pre-sale deal, worked on condos, townhouses, detaches on the res on both the buying and the selling side of things, pre-sales, trying to put a get together that land assembly, even commercial purchase and lease. Like that was like one of each, you know what I mean? <laughs> so I was like, I found that super cool to really be able to kind of see everything that I, everything that I could possibly do. And then start to double down the following year on what I was more effective in, what I enjoyed more. So, yeah. And I know that you're doing like everything too, right? Yeah. I'm kind of dealing the same with you, uh, yeah. same as you are right now, right? So uh, I focus mostly on residential, but I do commercial as well. Mm -hmm. But the where I want to see myself in the future is development, right? So I find a certain beauty in being able to find like an empty piece of land, um, doing your homework and your research on it and actually having a vision for that community, right? So um, you got to remember that a lot of these developers, they're creating like vibrant communities for people to live in, for people to grow and raise their families. And uh, they're adding value. At the end of the day, they're taking something that was absolutely nothing and turning it into a thriving community. And yeah, I think that's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, that's cool. And seeing something be built, you know what I mean? Seeing the whole process of it yeah. all. That's awesome. Yeah. I had a question for all you. So just uh, outside of real estate, just like, who are you guys? I saw this one thing, uh, well, like, especially Europeans, like when, you know, here people ask, oh, what do you do? So you start naming off your job and everything you do. Whereas there, they're just like, no, like I hike, I do bike. And like they list like what they actually like to do outside of work. Cause that's not, that doesn't define their life. So for you guys, you know, what do you do? Who are you guys outside of real estate? Ladies first. Yeah. I'm like a huge family girl. Like my best friend is like my sisters, my siblings, and my brother. Um, How many siblings? I have. There's five of us all together here, and I'm the oldest of five. Mm -hmm. um, so super close with them, super close with my family, and I'm a dog mom. I guess that's like kind of my part of my identity too. <laughs> you guys all have met Connor. Nice. Um, yeah, super active. Um, I love. I do love to hike and work out and stuff. So. I guess there's that part. So family girl, dog mom, and active. Yeah. Nice. Jason? Also, honestly, uh, I have a dog as well. So dog dad. <laughs> 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 That's definitely up there as well. Uh, absolutely love my dogs. Um, now only one of them, but yeah, absolutely love them. Um, as far as family goes, my family is everything to me. Um, I absolutely love spending time with my parents. So any time that I can free up, uh, I will spend with them. And then I have two younger sisters. My sisters are my life as well, right? So they're two of my best friends and we're really, really close. And nice thing is even our external friend group and everyone, we're all like family, right? So uh, we really, really enjoy spending our time together. And aside from that, man, like I'm an absolute gym rat, I'm going to the gym no matter what. Uh, I this joined a 20 huge. <laughs> no. <guy's> huge. Tell. <laughs> <laughs> joined a 24 hour gym just so when I do have those days where I'm can't get to it in the morning, I can't get to it by the afternoon. You'll probably catch me there at like 11 p.m. midnight, right? Mm -hmm. So wow. <laughs> wow. that's awesome. That's wild. Um, I'm same way. I love my family. Um, I'm always spending time with my niece and nephew. As it's pretty much takes up a lot of my Instagram stories apart from real estate <laughs> itself. <laughs> um, obviously, you kind of just touched upon it as well. Church is everything for, to me. My faith is everything to me. And I love martial arts, which is something that you and I got along with really well. Yeah, at the start. yeah. It's just like, hey, you wrestle? <laughs> yeah, you start talking about yeah. it. So No, that's awesome. Yeah, we know all about your life. So <laughs> yeah, we kind of just talked about all the crazy things yeah. that you are doing. Yeah, yeah. And then, yeah, I'm born and raised on the farm, uh, family. Uh, mm -hmm. I got two little girls, love them to death. Uh, my family, I got three siblings. I'm actually the baby of the family. And then all my cousins and stuff, we always hang out. And I love, you know, anytime we get together, it's the best of times. Mm -hmm. Those are the things I'm going to remember, like, for the rest of my life. For sure. And, yeah, outside of that, fitness, food. I like watching movies, TV here and there. And, uh, yeah. Cool. I think we all forgot food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Mad foodie over here. Yeah. Food is a love language. Yeah. 100%. Food is a love language. All right. Final question for Tracy. 
Okay. <laughs> I'm if popular you, too. If you heard the last one, if you heard the last last episode, you would have known what I was gonna ask. All right. What would younger Tracy, if you were to go back in time, what would you tell yourself? If I could go back in time, what would I tell myself? Yes. It's gonna be all invest in Google and Amazon and all of that. <laughs> um, I would say. <laughs> I wish I wish I was more prepared for this question. I would say That's the beauty of it. Yeah. Can we go around the table for us and come back to me? <laughs> um I'll let Jason answer yeah, first. You go first. Okay. Sorry, say that question one more what time. What would you tell you if you were to go back in time, if you could go back in time, what would you tell your younger self? Make more mistakes. Continue doing exactly what I did when I was younger. I did make a lot of mistakes, and thankfully I was smart enough to actually learn from them and carry that throughout my life. But definitely make more mistakes and make more time for my family. I feel like when you're young, you're always so fixated on certain things um, that won't necessarily mean anything to you in five or 10 years, right? So when I look back at times like this, I don't regret anything that I did in life, but I definitely wish I spent more time with my grandpa. I wish I spent more time with my grandma, right? Little things like that. Um, other than that, I feel like I've always been on the right trajectory, whether it's felt like it in the moment or not. You ready? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so I would say, you know, take everything in the moment for what it is. And um, not everything lasts forever, but treat everything as if not everything's going to last forever. So Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. You finish this one off. Um, I think all of them are going to be like time focused. Yeah. Like when you go back in time, it's like, how are you spending your time and what you kind of did? So it'll be one, like managing your time, like don't waste too much of your time on things that, you know, aren't going to take you to any of the goals that you have and just focus on the things that you actually value in your life. If it's family, if it's, you know, things that you're working towards, some stuff you're passionate about, you know, focus on those a little bit more and just don't waste uh, too much time on the outside things. Yeah, you know what? That I just thought about this right now. So, f- a friend of a friend of mine, he owns a media company out of Montreal. Um, he he went around and started asking people, "Would you rather have one million dollars or spend five minutes with your mom?" And pretty much everyone answered. Could you guess? With their mom. With their mom. Right. So, it, it just kind of goes to show: is time means everything, right? Time, yeah. time is the most valuable thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. just tying one thing into how you're mentioning about goals, right? Um, this might be a little bit top off topic, but I saw something really interesting. Again, it was an Instagram video, but they're talking about goals and your actual um, ambitions in life, right? So your goals and your ambitions in life are different, right? At the end of the day, your ambition might be to have a successful real estate business, but at the end of the day, your goal is to have a better life for your family, to travel more, whatever it is to you personally, right? So I feel like it's super important not to get those things mixed up because having a, 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 sorry, a successful real estate business might not necessarily be the end all be all if all the other things surrounding it aren't there. 100%. It's yeah. like once you get to the top, it's like, well, then what? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, it's about like being happy and being a good person. For sure. It's really easy to get lost, as especially as a real estate agent, to just consistently work towards something. So you're just consistently working towards, you know, being able to afford vacation for your family yeah. or being able to have more free time and all this stuff. But, like, there's time, you know? Like, you just kind of have to value everything you know, for what it is like in this very moment too. And it's just really easy to get lost towards working a sort towards a certain goal. And then you're just not present. And then once that time comes, like, you know, you're working towards the next goal and you're not even taking time to appreciate what you just worked hard for. I'm so. going to take your advice for younger Tracy or <laughs> present Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I got to take younger Tracy advice for present Tracy too. <laughs> there you go. And we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Thanks for coming on guys. Thanks guys. Well, thanks. And Great podcast. We'll see you next time. Yeah. <laughs> cool.